I'm going to want Bill to do the announcements next week. <laughs> Good job, Tiffany. But we have somebody contending for the job. We see this. No, and we actually, uh, this tomorrow evening is our uh, elder meeting, and then we will have prayer here uh, in the evening at 6 p.m. So come and join us. How many felt like a rogue wave might have just kind of lapsed over you this week a little bit? Uh, just feeling a little bit of that uh, weight and measure of uh, things coming against. And I think that's, you're in a good place. Welcome to our home, a church, a place to call home. This is a place that we welcome people just to hear from the Lord and to be, to honor him with your life and to demonstrate your love for him and your obedience. We get to do that in one mind, one body. You know, I thought about it. I told the men yesterday, Jesus didn't give the whole loaf to anybody. He just gave them a piece. Each one of us has a piece and each one does his part. So that nobody's doing everything. And, but we, he reveals his glory and his goodness to us every day. And I have felt the weight of this week. I know that uh, uh, as I've experienced that with some of you, walking in that rhythm. So I know that uh, we have a faithful God. And he walks through things. And he's walking you through it. And he's faithful to complete the work that he began. This week is going to be great as we had a great week last week, we talked about contending for the truth. And contending for the truth is a representation where we need to honor the truth and recognize the deception of the enemy. And anybody that is in spiritual bondage, bondage there is a lie. And where there is a lie, you're in spiritual bondage, not walking out the Christian faith in the way that God intended. It is in the measure of our belief in which we find the victory that God has intended. So what we talked about last week was that there are strongholds. These are the thoughts in our mind that build up. And it, is, it doesn't matter where the lie comes from, whether from a friend, whether from a false prophet or preacher. It doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, from the demonic powers. It's the lie that you believe that is given weight and power in your life. And what we have is this gift, the word of God for our life. You know, when Jesus was in the wilderness, he had many ways in which he could have contended with the devil as he was tempted. He could have said, do you not know who I am? Were you not there when, when all things were created? Do you not know who I am? Born of a virgin birth, the deity coming from heaven incarnate. Do you not know who I am? The one that has power over life and death. Were you not there when I split the seas? Were you not there when these miracles were conducted? But that is not what he relied on. He did not rely on his post, his position, or his person. He said, it is written. And he did that for your good and for mine. He said, it is written, and that is what he used as his weapon of warfare against the enemy. And I don't know if we can even share enough how important it is for you to know the word of God. False prophets can can bring messages that are false, and you wouldn't know the difference if you don't know the Word of God. It's too easily persuaded in this world by the messaging, and uh, whether it be CNN or Fox, the false prophets on MSP, uh, it doesn't matter where, where we hear these messages or the, the design of these messages. It's people assuming outcomes. It's people uh, declaring their own agendas. But God has an agenda, and His Word is clear, and His agenda is actually for you, not against you. His word is pure. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what his word says. Even when you're, the weight of the world feels like it's coming against you and you're alone. His word is pure and it's clear when he says that he's lavished his love upon you, that you would be called sons and daughters of God because that is who you are. When you fight, well, but Lord, I know other people are loved, but not me. When you try to contend in your mind that you're excluded from the gift that God has given, it is clear in his word that you are not excluded, that he loves you. He loves you with a purpose. But you see how easy it is to be deceived by our emotion, by the circumstances of our life. Uh, the enemy has rehearsed many times over how to work against you. He is a, a battle of silhouettes and shadows. He has no grip on you unless you give it to him. You know, the enemy is a part of our life, even with victory. 
I know this to be true because otherwise it would not have warnings in the Word of God against the enemy. It would not tell us that our weapons are not carnal but are mighty through prayer. It wouldn't have told us to put on a full armor of God if we were on vacation. He has told us these things because we are contending in a war that has already been won. But that doesn't mean that the enemy in his desperation does not try to lie about its outcome. And so we know that if you are experiencing in your life a need for deliverance and you have tried at many levels and have not found it, I believe that God still has a path forward for you. We talked about deception last week. This week, we are going to become intimate with your downfall through the power of seduction. The power of seduction, being intimate with your downfall. What better way to look at this than from Judges 16 uh, with a, a mighty man of God, but mighty only in strength, and his name was Samson. Would you open to Judges chapter 16? Verse 1. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute, and he went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. How many know that your enemy just lays in wait? They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn will kill him. Our enemy is patient sometimes. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Something awakened him. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. They can be placed upon the backs of God's people. They don't have to be the defense that the enemy has. There was nothing that could hold Samson because he had the power of God in him that night. Sometime later, uh oh, he fell in love with the woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secrets of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Hmm. Kind of foolish if you say, well, how can you tie him up? What, tying him up wouldn't do anything. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings, that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. So then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied them with them. And with men again hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped those bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of strength had yet to be discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson again, you have made a fool of me. Has the enemy ever told you? You made a fool of me. We were in a good relation. We were doing good together. Now you've rejected me. You're making a fool of me. You're making a mockery. Just as he said that he has signed to the cross and made a mockery of our enemy. Even the enemy, I guess, has a little bit of emotion in this game. Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, once again, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? I mean, can we not get a clue here? I mean, Samson is a real fool, but we're going to talk about that. This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. And with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. You see, no razor has ever been used on my head. 
He said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb, if my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. So when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, for he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hand. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. The Spirit of God left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And when he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Well, that's a red flag in any relationship, right? A red flag is a warning signal or a sign. We talk about the idea of this seduction that Delilah has over Samson. And you read this narrative, but there's so much that we can gain from this. Do we not want what we want? Sometimes are our desires not intimate to the enemy's plan more than they are to God? How easy is it for us to get lost in the seduction of this world? And if you didn't know, when it says that we are lovers of this world, that means that we're lovers of the way of Satan. We're lovers of the demonic powers that have a stronghold over life, bondage. That's what we love. It's all a lie. It's cloaked in deception. In our relationships with one another, red flags are signposts of future problems. Are you taking heed to those things? A warning signal or a sign, something that indicates or draws attention to a problem, a danger or regularity. If your time is spent with the Lord in a regular basis, the irregularity becomes clear. But if you're patterned to this world, if your life is focused on your desire, it's not so much of an irregularity or an abnormality, is it? How did I get here? You know how many people say that? How did I come so far? How did I fall so greatly? It's because they didn't see the red flags, the warning signs. They didn't see that Satan's seduction of the things that he offers were holding him captive in this way. So how do we combat this? How do we combat this desire in our heart, this seduction that the enemy uses? He actually speaks of it before he tells of the truth and his secret. We are called to live a holy life. We are called to holiness. In our progressive ideology in the worldview today, we have God, but we don't need to give God everything. We cherry pick through the word of God, the prosperity and the things that we want, but we're unwilling to serve him at the level in which he asks of us, requires of us to be in relationship with him. But he has called us to live a holy life. Judges 13, 4, and 5, if you go back, explains what this Nazarite vow is. Verse 4 of chapter 13. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. He was speaking to Samson's mother. Verse 5, you will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb, from birth. For he will take lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The Nazarite vow actually did not require a lifetime. The Nazarite vow could have been a vow in which no razor would touch their head, that they would touch nothing unclean, that they would not drink, and it would be like a a, a process of fast in covenant with God, honoring him. But Samson, it was from birth. As Samson made his Nazarite vow, the meaning of the word is to be separated, to be consecrated, to be sanctified. A covenant with God was for the holy life. We are all called to that holy life. And with this holy life, there is a requirement for us to live apart. There is a requirement for us to live apart from the desires of this world. Do you know the desires in your heart that are of this world and the desires in your heart that are of God? Can you tell the difference? The word of God is what declares this. It's the way that we balance through and measure the light that reveals to us. There's a growing 
sensitivity in my heart to understand the differences. It's so deceptive to be allured and callous by the things. We have these imprints of images, you know. We can watch all this entertainment, but violence actually has a measure of outcome. It will affect you. How many saw the attempt of assassination on uh, next president-elect, right? If this would have happened in former days, our culture would have been aghast rather than speculating conspiracy immediately. Things are different today. There is a level of deception in our world that we have become so greatly deceived and our desires are so much greater than the truth. You can hear people say, oh, that's fake or, or no, this is, that's the only way to get ahead and, and life must be taken for us to get our way, the desires of the world. There is so much going on in this world today that we need to be more aware and vigilant as to the deception. We have a love for this world, and we are not to be of this world. We're in it, but not of it. We have a different requirement altogether. Make no mistake, when we see in Scripture the words, love of the world, as I said, it's a love of the way of Satan. It's a love of the ways of rebellion. Many have heard that Satan was an archangel, you know. It actually doesn't say that in the Word of God. It says that he was a cherub. He was a cherubim. And he was an anointed cherubim. And the cherub would actually be the angel that covers the glory of God. We see it on the Ark of Covenant, that the angel's wing that would cover the glory and presence of God. He didn't want to be his covering. He wanted to be over him in a different manner. It's natural that the cherub would actually desire in a holy manner to be the covering of the glory of God. But instead, in rebellion, he uncovered the glory of God and said, no, I want to be the one to receive glory. A desire, a rebellion, the heart of Satan. The desires of seduction of this world is for pleasure and desire. It's for convenience and for comfort. It is for the measure of what you want rather than what is good. We have all been this place in our life. When you're younger, it's easier to understand these things, and, and you think, oh, they'll just grow out of it. Do people grow out of sin, or do they grow in it? The path that you take as it's measured, people cut and blaze the trail, but then others will take that, that route because it's easier, and then it widens, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life, and few will find it. The lie is that what we desire will satisfy and that the other side of that coin of the lie is how much of the lie will actually take us away from what will satisfy the relationship with Christ. We have one side of the coin that tells us that you and your desire, that it will meet your needs, it will satisfy your needs and your wants. Take lust, for instance, as this is obviously the occupation of our thoughts. I want relationship. I want sexual relation. I want from this. And what's the lie? That it'll actually satisfy. That you can have it outside of the relationships that God created. See, God created relationship. He created it good. He said it is not good that man is alone. And he created a spouse, a help me for him. This is the, the requirements that we fall into the category of that love, but it, that it would be monogamous with the one that God has created. And commitment, that's what God really cares about more than anything, is that covenant and commitment that is lifelong. And it gathers so much more in its power and its strength as we live together. But others, we want to shortcut that. We want it now. We can't wait. Samson didn't want to wait. It's interesting, if you read right in the beginning there, and this is not the first time for Samson, by the way. If you go back in chapter 13, he was in Timnah, and he tells his parents, I want, and I'll paraphrase, I want a woman from the world. I want a Philistine woman. That's what he said. And what did they say? Don't you want somebody from our people? <laughs> somebody that's equal in faith, somebody that's equal in the measure of our beliefs and our system. And what takes place? No, I want what I want, and I, I'm going to get what I want. And what did he do? He used his strength to get it. 
hold on. It's okay. I'm going to call you out if you can't turn that off. No. That is, it's the Bible app. It's the Bible app. It's nothing sinful. It's not a game. Bobby's watching the game. She's listening to the Bible. It's all good. <laughs> Tell me how the service goes. No, just kidding. No, it's good. We're, we're so easy going here. But in effect, he wanted from the world what the world offered. There was evidence that his vow that his mother made from his birth had a purpose for his life. God had a purpose for his life. And he abandoned it for desire. He was seduced by that desire. But here's the biggest issue. Where's the deception? That he thought that his strength could overcome. That he would overcome his enemy even though he desired to be amongst his enemy that he could overcome them. That's the greater deception. Notice how many red flags should have been going off as a siren just from God alone. Sexual misconduct, immorality, brawling, parties. Samson was in the throes of a rave day and night. And that's not the first time. Now he goes to a prostitute. But then as he is in the process of these relationships, getting what he wants, all of a sudden something happened, something shifted, and he fell in love or lust. But then what he thought he had a hold of got a hold of him. It's interesting if you look back in, uh, in Timna with his first spouse, he should have learned from this because from the world he got betrayed. If you recall uh, in the story as he's on his way, he saw a lion, rips it apart with his hands, and inside of the carcass of the lion is a beehive. And so he gives a riddle to these men. And not only does it happen with Delilah, but it happens in the same manner. They didn't want to be embarrassed. And so they said, tell us, asking his newfound spouse, tell us what all this means. Tell us what the riddle is so that we don't walk away poor from this uh, wedding ceremony. So he's been betrayed before. But does that change his action? Does it change yours? When the addiction, when the things that hold you bound, when the torment and the, uh, and the process of, of living in and amongst the world, thinking it won't get a hold of you, are you not betrayed? But do you return? As a dog returns to his vomit, so a, a fool returns to his folly. Are we not that way? It's the nature within us if we haven't allowed for the replacement of our nature that God has given us. Samson's vow should have kept him as far from Gaza and his desire, but he did not suppress it. Philistine's camp and culture was strong, but he thought he was stronger. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, but don't tamper with the world. That's the issue. I have God, but I can slack. Because I have 80% God and only 20% sin, things are going good for me. These are the lies of the enemy. The seduction of the world is relevant. It's like a magnet drawing us in like flies to that little zapper. <laughs> Down you go. We'll get to the answer. But let's ask, why did Samson's, Samson's strength not leave him the moment he broke his Nazarite vow? And it wasn't just taking the razor to his head. He had eaten unclean meat. He had, he had partaken in drinking. I'm pretty sure of that. Sexual immorality. There's a level here that there is an element of grace of God's uh, long-suffering and patience. God is not condoning your sin if you haven't seen the outcome and consequence of it. There's a grace that exists, but it is so that you turn and repent, not so that you go further into sin. An Old Testament figure who should have seen the red flags in the relationship as a judge is Samson. Samson was mighty. He was powerful because of his call that God had to defend the Israelite people. And his strength came from that Nazarite vow not to cut his hair. Though chosen by God, Samson was often tempted to pursue his own desires. We are also often tempted and it's usually in desire. And desire is actually a form of weakness. It's, an, it's a place of weakness when desires or the emotions uh, are stronger than our resolve. That's where the enemy can seduce. 
and deceive. God called him to defend. Though chosen by God, Samson was often to de- often tempted to pursue his own desire. He fell in love with the Philistine woman uh, by the name of Delilah. The Philistines were his enemies, but he wanted Delilah. But he didn't realize he gave entrance for his demise. Delilah did not love him in the same way. She was used from that day. The enemy and its path, path and plan and its purpose is to steal then kill, then destroy. The enemy wants to steal what we have so that we don't have something to stand on so that he can kill and and we're on uneven ground. You can be on the firm foundation of the word and the enemy has no place. It says submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say that he has any room to win that fight. But I will say that in the word of God, when it comes to sexual desire, it says flee. Just says flee. These desires in our heart, if you allow those passions to burn, if you allow them to come and rise within you, if you even, I'm just going to be curious and see, I'm going to tamper with this a little bit, it'll be to your end. That's a warning. Samson's life is a warning to us. They wanted to kill him. She seduced him. She wanted to know where his great strength lies. Why? What does she gain from this? Paid off just bribery. The enemy is out to take you out for its own desire. There is an unseen realm of those that have fallen. They cannot rest. You see, as it says that uh, that when the strong man is bound and taken out and sweep clean, puts in order that house, but it says that that demonic presence, it exits into the desert, so it's bound to the earth, and yet it roams, so obviously it needs rest. Number two, it's obviously not omnipresent because it has to travel. If you're omnipresent, you don't have to travel, just saying. So, but it's patient, and it comes back to torment. It comes back to see if there's an open door, and we know that in this, that that is for the unbeliever that gives residence because you are not empty. You're full of the Spirit of God. There's no place for him. But you can entertain that torment. You can entertain that which is in your past. You can let that in to your life. And we do it through the seduction of sin and desire. You think you're moving ahead in your your love for God. You've justified in your heart that there's no difference, that you're stronger than your enemy. But then you will find that the enemy may have a hold of you. She seduced him. Wanted to know where his strength lies. For just 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies. How you might be bound that one could subdue you. That is a very bold question from your. Can you tell me where your weakness is? That's pride. If you answer that question, you should be looking in your heart. But that's pride. That is not why he was given the power to deliver his people. It was not for his pride. But he thought himself, he toyed with the enemy, and it was pride that comes before a fall. After she asked the question, Samson, he jokes, Philistines attack. But then something inside of him, and I think this is an important key factor. We have to realize, you can toy with the enemy, you can play with the enemy, you can even push back the enemy. But if you're in that world, over time, the enemy will win. You do not have power over sin. Christ does. Our focus is on the light, not on the world because we have the light. We need to be wholly set apart and live a holy life. But I will tell you this, and this is the next point. God can use bad situations to fulfill good purposes. God can use our bad situations and accomplish his good. God still works. This is the sovereignty. One of the things that... uh, uh, in this week, as I was dialoguing with some people in council uh, that are going through consequences of their own, God can still accomplish good in it. God is not bound by consequence. He's sovereign over them. That's why he allows them. God would have to navigate around the, uh, every consequence that we face based upon the variable of our choosing, but he's over all of that. He's already fully aware 
and he has wisdom beyond this. And God still used this because even in Timnah, as things were uh, challenged and changed, there was an accepted uh, process of, of exchange. We love the babies. We love the babies. No, there's an accepted ch- process of change here. Here's Samson, and he's going to Timnah. He's having this marriage. He's in the world, but he gets frustrated because she gives away his riddle. What does she, he do? He ties up a bunch of foxes' tails and sends them into all their fields and destroys their crops and all of their, their uh, goods. So God uses that to deliver his people. All right. Then he goes out there into the, the midst of the cave and, and, and uh, the people of Israel, they're like, what are you doing? We're kind of under their occupation. You're making it bad for us. He goes, well, just tie me up and send me over to him then. And he takes the jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand men. Uh, I mean, God uses him and uses the strength in him, but do not equate God's condoning because you see God's still working. That's what many have failed in ministry. They see the goodness of God, they see the anointing on their life, and that's a gift from God, and it's not going to be taken away. You see, God can still use you to evangelize. God can still use you in your knowledge and your wisdom. God can still use you in ministry, but if you're in sin, that sin's going to find you out. It'll be your demise. It may not be the others that you served, but it will be yours. But it could be their downfall too. You see, the flaws of our actions oftentimes still lead to disillusionment of others that we've led. It's a great cost. But God can use bad situations to fulfill those good purposes. Samson, whether in love or lust with a person who's not good for him, Delilah, though Delilah is at fault, we wonder why Samson didn't see the red flags. Maybe God kind of used that. It's a possibility that God just let him kind of continue in that sin for his lesson because we do see the repentant heart in the end. The woman is asking how to take away his strength, doing what he tells her while he's asleep, and someone is always the one who tells him that the Philistines are attacking. There is all manners of sketchiness in that. But yet, he's blinded to this. Do you think sin sometimes can be deceptive? Maybe to the point that we don't see the truth in it? And I think that's part of this. Maybe we, we need, the only way we're going to see the signs is accountability one to another. The only way we see the signs is when we have the truth against the lie. It's the blind leading the blind otherwise, right? So, he spoke to that. Religiosity and knowledge doesn't change. It's the sensitivity of the spirit that changes it. Finally, Samson tells her the truth about his strength, and she said to him, how can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me three times. Three times it happened in Timnah, three times again. He has a little bit of a pattern here due to his urges. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day, urged him, nagged him. His soul was vexed. He was turned in his emotion. He was actually, his mind, will, and emotions were turned. He felt sorry for not telling her. He gave way to the sin. He gave way to this desire. He gave way to his entrapment. You think yourself strong emotion, you think yourself strong in mind, but that vexing comes after the nagging, dripping faucet. Sin is not a discriminator, and it doesn't give up. It is looking, it's roaming, seeing that which it can devour. It is a hunger within, and it desires, like a parasite, to win. And it's not for its own gain. Sin is a nature within all of us. We have a disease, a condition. And it's only by the the grace of God and by the power of his cleansing blood that we have any freedom from it. And our victory is by our focus on what he's offered and our surrender to him. He told her all that was in his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. I do believe that there are times that the addiction holds so strong that we give away our integrity. I think there are times that the the seduction is so strong and sin's desire is so strong that we compromise and we reveal that which was given that is sacred. After he tells Delilah, 
She cuts his hair off while he's sleeping. The Philistines come, they subdue him, torture him, take him captive. They said they were going to humble him, but they actually gouged his eyes out. He was blinded. His strength did leave him because the Spirit of God, anointed, left him. Now, next point, you are free to choose. You are. You are free to choose your actions, but you are not free to choose your consequences. I think we try to control the consequences thinking that our choices, and believe me, we spend a lot of time in that process of thinking, I'll choose this, I'll hide it this way, I'll continue to deviate, I'll do a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, you know, repentance or, you know, work a little bit more at church or read my Bible a little bit more, but I'm just going to give a little bit here and then I'm going to give back a lot more. We start to justify in our mind ways around to justify our sin. Instead of understanding that he did give us free will and our free will is to choose him. Our free will is to choose him. We do get this choice of action, even as children of God. He has not even taken that away. He has demonstrated great love and wisdom to give us the opportunity to choose him every day, to take up our cross daily, to live for him fully. But then we have within us the sin nature. We're no longer at enmity with God if you've received him, but we are at enmity with our flesh. Our spirit and our flesh are at enmity, and we must choose to reside in the resource of the spirit of God rather than in the, the spirit of this world. But there is some fallacy that makes you believe that you can control the consequences. Have you ever believed that? That you'll control the narrative, then you can control the consequence? That if you control the lie, that you can control the consequence and you tell a bigger lie? These are the dangers. The issue with Samson, the problem with Samson was not simply that he loved a woman, but the kind of woman he loved. In principle, there is nothing wrong with a man loving a woman, is there? After all, marriage is an institution sanctioned by God. It depends upon the love of a man for his wife and the love of a woman for her husband. The issue here is the kind of person that he loved, the kind of thing that he loved. It's the kind of thing that we love that gets in the way. Samson proved his carnal desires were outside of God's uh, people for him. He became married to an enemy. Have we sometimes found ourselves married to the enemy? I'm not saying that in your marriage. I'm talking about it. <laughs> Proverbs 21, better to be on the housetop than inside with that dripping faucet. He became married to the enemy, and with his marriage, he came in betrayal, and his further action, stepping out of that relationship in Timnah, he found a prostitute, then he found Delilah. He was looking for his desires to be fulfilled in the wrong place. Sometimes that wrong place is just timing. Sometimes that wrong place is in the, the group of people that you've been with in the past. We can define worldly de desire as unstable emotion. Worldly desire is just unstable emotion. And the word of God, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, it's a simple reminder, choose a mate within your faith. That's actually, I, I mean... What a great reminder of the downfall when we don't. Simple reminders, it takes us out of God's provision. It takes us away from our accountability. It takes us away and creates struggle and strife. So be equally yoked. It says, do not be unequally yoked with the believer. Do not be yoked together. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Bilal? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? There's no commonality. What agreement is there between the temple of God and of idols? For we are the temple of the living God. We belong to him. We are a spiritual house being built up for his presence. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So he says to us, do not be unequally yoked to the desires of this world. Do not be seduced by that desire. Do not be tempted by impatience. Do not be tempted that what you can provide in your life is better than what God has given. And do not be deceived that you're stronger than what this world has coming at you without him. Every choice you make will either bring you farther or closer to God. Next point. Every 
choice you make will either bring you further, draw you closer, or further from him. Every choice. We forsake that. I'll just make these choices, but it's only the top ten that actually make and affect my relationship with him. No. Every choice you make is, is attached to an eternal string. Every choice you make in your life has an eternal purpose to it, has an eternal consequence to it. God has given us a life. Everything that you've done in your life is still attached to you. Every emotion that you've felt, every memory that you have, but he has, he has drafted all of that and put it upon the cross, and he has won the victory and has given you a new life as a new creation. Do not forsake that. Otherwise, you're just going to be spending your time burdened by the memory of your past of guilt and shame. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live according to his goodwill and purpose, by his spirit. There is condemnation in this world, by the way. If you don't take God into a condemning place, it grieves him. That's where his heart's at. The Bible doesn't just tell us tragic stories, but it also gives us wisdom in these relationships. From Scripture, we can learn the types of these red flags we should be paying attention to so that we can have healthy and flourishing relationships. One of my last points, use your strength for God's purpose in your life. Samson used the strength that he had to toy with his enemy instead of deliver the people, and which is what the purpose of God gave him that power for, that strength for. Use your strength. Use your wisdom. Use your knowledge. Use that little part of the body, that piece of bread that you are a part of for the glory of God. Just in a moment right here, what, what is it in your spirit right now? What is it, Lord, that I haven't given to you? Where have I not aligned to your purpose in my life? What things am I doing for myself, my own desire, my own purposes, my own good, my own satisfaction, my own contentment versus for your good. Where can I give? Where can I sacrifice more? What do I have to offer? Let that be your living act and sign of worship to him. That's what we need right now is to really take into consideration, God, you didn't give me strength just to battle my enemy. You gave me strength so that I can follow the purposes that you have for me. But he did give us the ability to overcome. There is no temptation that is common to man that God has not given us a way out and escape. So you may feel burdened. You may feel desire. And it may even weigh like a lie that's bigger than what you're experiencing right now. But I tell you what, the truth is in his word. And he has never left or forsaked. And he is always working for our good. What good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly? So if you're in question of why God hasn't given something in your desire, you ask if it's his desire first. And second, you ask him if there's anything that stands in the way of his purposes in your life. And I promise you that his purposes are greater for your life than you can conduct and make of your own. This is the thought and lesson. No matter how strong Samson was, his strength came from God. His commitment to God mattered. We have similar application in our life. The best life is fulfilled by giving your life and surrender to the work in order that God has purposed for you. In our weakness, he has made us strong. Our desire for the flesh and the world can be put to death. Our sign of the Nazarite vow is baptism. That is the covenant that is, is in symbol is equal to that Nazarite vow. And it is a consecration set apart in confession of what God has done and what you are willing. That is the, the man, the old man dying and the new rising. And that we can be in order, that we can rise in the power and purposes of God with the strength of God that is indwelling within us. Can you overcome sin? No, you don't have that strength. But it's the strength of God in you that gives you that. And if you're illiterate of the word of God, you don't spend time with him. If you are emaciated because your desires are stronger than your desire for him, ask for a hunger for him. Ask for the hunger that the spirit is given to you so that you can grow, that you can know and acknowledge that in him, there's victory. We are at war, and we don't want to back into the battlefield. How many have backed into a battlefield before? <laughs> Whoops. That might just be a conversation with your spouse. But I have backed into the battlefield of other men all the time. The struggles that you don't see coming, the kind of 
sideswipe you. Sometimes it's just because we're in transition. Sometimes it's because we're in question and our emotion. And, and, and when we're weak, where did Satan come to tempt Jesus? In his fast, in the middle of the desert. Where does he come? He comes when, we, when he sees these weaknesses in us. He comes in these transitions of our life, questions of our life, the unknowns. And you have a choice, and you have two roads, and you have one man giving directions, living, and you have one man that's a dead giving directions. Which one are you going to follow? Dead man's directions are hard to follow. Follow the man that gives life. The enemy, if it cannot prevent you, it will pervert your desire. If the enemy cannot pervert, I'm sorry, can't prevent you doing what God has called you to, then he'll try to pervert it. We see these distortions all the time. We do it in ministries. Sometimes even uh, the way that we see that ministries are built on, they're built more on the rev- less of the purpose of God, more of the perversion of our, our desire. These are uh, marriages in the same way. We pervert the truth. We twist the truth. Even if you go back to the origin of, of sin and its defense, the first thing of deception was twisting the words of God. That's a perversion. The enemy, if it can't prevent you, it will pervert your desire within you. Marriages fall in his plan, but rushing to meet your needs over God's purpose can lead to that consequence. The things of God take time because everything that he's doing has eternal purpose, has a strength and eternal purpose. Believe me, that consequence has, in the statistics of the church, proves that it is possible that he can't prevent marriage, but he can definitely pervert it. Three out of four marriages are failing in the church today. Maybe there's a little bit of our desire still within us instead of our commitment to God's purpose that leads to that. So many people are broken. It's twisted love. What is love? Baby, you hurt me. You hurt me. No, no I, But the, the truth is that the love of God is pure. Love is pure. It doesn't anger. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. But the purity of love, can we have love, one for God, we learn from God and we give to others that love. But if you are challenged by these desires and seductions, it's hard to overcome that. There are so many ways in which we can get hold to the plan of God, but it's the patience and virtue of the fruit of the Spirit and self-control that will lead to everlasting life, that will lead us into the purposes of God and will lead us to the function of his desire for us over our desire. And if you have a desire in your heart, ask him for a hunger and a desire that is greater of him. That's how we overcome this. It's so simple, but you must dedicate your time to him to overcome the desires of this world. That's what it takes. Give your time to him, and the word becomes so much more powerful in you. You'll become the man or woman of God that you want to be if you give your time to him as he has purposed. Spend your time in worship. God provides a good life. Samson still had an enemy. He was never supposed to be uh, intimate with them, and he was intimate with his demise. But there is a point in that story where his hair grew back. I pray for this every day. I promise you that. (laughs) But there was a point. It's kind of the show of God's grace. And his enemy wasn't paying attention. They shaved his locks. But he was asked to be placed between the pillars of his enemy. And his repentant heart, because his hair had grown back. If you've sinned, if you've fallen, just know there is a grace that restores. It can bring back that vow. It can bring back that covenant. It was a cost of his life, but he gained life that day, and he took out his enemy. We have, before we may pray, we have this beautiful couple, Michael and Elizabeth, who have been a part of our body since the tent days, out on wood chips and white chairs, out in the middle of woods before they were logs, 
and they've just been a great resource, aid, and help, and they wear the perfect shirt, a church to call home, and this is home to them, and God has called them uh, just to finish out this year to see where he leads, but they have a missions call. If you don't know Michael well enough or Elizabeth, he has had a call for the ministry to the military uh, on his heart for so long, and Elizabeth with her counsel, uh, they have served in that ministry. They've given greatly to this body, but they have felt that call to go and and be with uh, and among the people to serve. He's going right into the Philistines' camp. Just keep your, my eyes, keep your covenant. Um, but God has used them. And I have seen so much growth, and I can say that humbly from just watching and observing as they bring so much to me as well. But just watching them nurture the relationship they have to minister together in this season has been why I see that God is opening up the doors for them. And as uh, they will go and re uh re kind of connect uh, with a program called Reboot, and they're going to be a part of the chaplaincy on base. And so they won't be with us to the end of the year for certain. But this transition, it, it comes with celebration, and it's hard. Uh, but we love to be a sending body and re returning people to the call and the mission that God has put in their heart. But I'd like you guys to come up. We're going to stand together, and we're going to pray over them uh, in a sending manner. And uh, we just love that Bill... Rick, Forrest, come on forward, you two, and everybody that loves them. And even if you don't, come and put, lay hands on them. And we're going to pray for them. This is our family. This is our home. And they've been a great service. Use your strength. Use your strength. And as Michael and Elizabeth, they are using the strength that God has put in their life for God's purpose in this season. So, Father, we just thank you for Michael and Elizabeth. We thank you for their love for each other, but ultimately, Lord, their love for you. We thank you, Lord, that they have a love for the lost and that they desire to lead uh, your children into the light. I thank you, Lord, that they have a ministry for the heart and emotional trauma that people have experienced. And, Lord, there are so many broken hearts and so many broken minds that need a touch from you, Lord. So I pray that you would make them ambassadors. Uh, to that ministry, Lord, that they would be alongside of those that are feeling the weight of the world on their shoulders, Lord, and that you would use them to bring a confidence with your word that would bring healing to their heart and healing to their lives. I pray as an, they are instruments of you, God, and that they would be in tune to your spirit, and Lord, that they'd be used. And I remember that even the harp that was played by David removed the tormenting spirits. And I just pray that as instruments of praise, that, Lord, you would remove the tormenting spirits that people feel in their lives from the things that they have seen, the things that the enemy has implanted, and, Lord, give freedom and victory. But I thank you, Lord, for the hedge of protection and strength around their marriage. I thank you, Lord, that you will use them mightily as they are an open door of hospitality to those in need, as they have for many here. But, Lord, restore to them, Lord, anything that they've given, given tenfold to them, and may they always know that this is a home for them and a place in which they uh, can stand upon. Lord, as we support, we pray, we do not give up in relation, but we stand in the gap now as you will work and we will see the good work of your hand, even in this year. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless them. Give them a hug. Whoa. Love them. Love them. Yeah. All right. That's easy. You can participate. You can keep in connection with them if God has put it on your heart that you, there's a way that you can serve with them. Uh, please, uh, we are all seeing and, and, and believing for God's purposes. We are a sending body. We love that. I'm grateful we got people from Vision School. Joy came and Sarah. Uh, uh, Robert's going to be coming back. He's just out in the field. Uh, we're going to be praying for Dylan next week because God's sending him on his medical mission. And, uh, you know, these are, these are the times that God is using us. We need to stay on target. Yes. Uh, Robert had a Oh. Yeah, we, that's good. That is a perfect thing. Yeah, he just got back uh, from Turkey. And so... Uh, and I think the food is still good, but just got a little... I, I got food poisoned on the plane, not anywhere in international <laughs> countries. But let's pray together really quickly. Father, this message, Lord, is from your heart to ours. 
Lord, it is easy to be seduced and then deceived. Lord, it is easy for desire to lead us into deception. But I pray for strength in this body. I pray for the strength to uh, be aware and for you to reveal in our hearts, Lord, that, that which does not belong, that which is the enemy's entrapment or seduction. I pray against the, the immaturity of emotion that would lead us into deception. I pray, God, that we can mature in faith, that we would turn to your word, that we would become mighty through our prayer, Lord. I pray that you would begin to shape and use us, Lord, and fashion us for your, your mighty army. For our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through prayer. May we be mindful of putting on the full armor of God, the truth of your gospel, the, the righteousness in our stand with you, that we would not forsake that, that we would not give up our ground to the enemy, but we are taking ground. So, Father, each individual here stands before you. None of us will stand together. We all stand alone before you. So each one of us must commit our life to you. We must commit what we have to offer and commit our life in, in what you have required. But, Lord, it is the free gift of grace. It is the free gift of your life. Lord, you gave your life so that we can have ours. So, Father, I just ask that anyone that is, is burdened by the deliverance that they are in need of for salvation, Lord, freedom from sin is deliverance, and it's called salvation. Lord, because of your sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice, you have made a mockery of the enemy that tries to entangle us. So we cast out the enemy in our life and send it back to its assignment at the cross. May we not be burdened, but may we be burdened by the proof of your purpose in our life. For your yoke is easy and your burden is light. But Father, strengthen us. May we hold one another accountable, grow in faith, grow in our purpose, but grow in the mission that you have for us. But may we be diligent just to give you the time from this precious life that you've given to us. With our families, together, in Jesus' name. Yes, I would like to pray one last prayer. My wife got a little uh, extraction of her tooth, and then they did a little bone graft and a little implant. It's painful, and then we can pray for Robert. How many are in need of just healing today? Just a little recovery. And Joy, Mike, yeah, Mike, Laura, and uh, Monica, your wife, her mom, 94, in Hong Kong. You know, there's a lot of need, right? If you need, would you just put your hand up? If you lay hands on the people next to you that have need of healing, we can reach each other today. We can give God a few more minutes. If you have a burden in your mind and need healing of your mind, no T-Rex hands, extend those hands and touch each other for the glory of God. Father, we thank you. You are faithful, Lord. Deliverance from our sickness is called healing. Lord, by your stripes we are healed. Lord, we ask that you would unburden us, Lord, from the pain and that you would restore, Lord Jesus, in, in the body. Restore in the body, Lord, the needs, in the mind, in the soul. Lord, even the things that we have walked through this, this week that have imprinted upon us that make us feel unworthy or make us feel that we have drawn back, Lord. I, I pray against uh, the enemy's design. I pray against the lie, and I thank you, God, for the victory. We thank you for victory over our bodies, over the victory over our soul and our mind, because we have the mind of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And because, Lord, you are the creative, miracle-working God. So impart to us, Lord, in this season for all the needs that are represented here. For Robert, as he is sick at home, Lord, uh, just heal his body. We have faith to believe. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This week we're going to have plenty of projects.
Monday night we have prayer together. Go with God if you have needs. Please do not leave and get prayed for. Yes. Last Monday. So that's not this Monday. That's next Monday. Okay. The calendars, they work in my life. I just don't use them. So it's not this Monday for Monday prayer. It's next Monday. So now you have time to put it on your calendar. All right. God bless you. Love you. See you next week.